Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. An official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. A century ago, Alaska, our most northern frontier, was popularly called Seward's Folly. The top of the world seemed remote then, but today the polar concept has changed our ideas of distances, and now that which was once considered a wasteland is of great military importance, and a vital link in our preparations to ensure security. The mission of our army in Alaska is to repel any aggressive action and be prepared to hit back. An important segment of our force which is fulfilling that purpose are men who were born above the Arctic Circle, the Alaskan Scouts. They, along with the rest of our military establishment, undergo constant training and re-evaluation in this land where nature herself is hostile, Alaska. That's Nunavak, just a tiny dot of an island on the map. But like all other settlements of our northern frontier, a big contributor in our country's effort to stop the spread of communism. On the surface, things look the same here as they've been for hundreds of years. That's what one might think at a first glance. But you find out differently if your assignment is to help train the scout units of the Alaska National Guard. Increased contact with the outside world has changed the outlook for the Eskimos. There's a great thirst for knowledge and much emphasis is placed on the importance of schooling for the future generation. Making ends meet here is still a matter of living off the country, and prosperity for Eskimo families depends on the whims of nature. Seals are in great abundance and provide much of the winter's food supply. But this interest in the Arctic doesn't seem to meet with the approval of all its inhabitants. Reindeer not only provide meat, but strong, pliable hides as well. This leather is used in making most of the clothing in the Eskimo wardrobe. Dire necessity was the mother of many an Eskimo invention, which has enabled him to survive in the Arctic. The kayak's design hasn't changed in a thousand years, and the development of the dog sled had the same effect in the frozen north as did the development of the automobile in the United States. Only difference is, there's no traffic problem here. This is the family car of the Arctic. It took generations of breeding to finally produce the strain of husky that had the same relative power and endurance as an engine off a Detroit production line. These people are great hunters, and a prize catch is a walrus, a veritable gold mine. Every part of it is put to use. The meat is food. The blubber gives oil for heat and light and the intestines are used for making excellent waterproof garments and food containers. Tools and many kinds of decorative objects are carved from the ivory tusks. This is the way of life in the frozen north, the region which has become one of the most strategically important spots in the world. This is the life that the polar concept is changing. These are the citizen soldiers whose skills and knowledge of the ways of the Arctic have become the eyes and ears of America's defense effort in the North. That's Jimmy Williams chopping wood. Sergeant Jimmy Williams of the 2nd Scout Battalion of the Alaska National Guard. His doorway looks out over the ice flows toward the east. Across that sea is the land of the Soviets, Russian Siberia. That's one of the big reasons why Jimmy's joined the Scouts. He and his family hardly know an idle moment. There are no fancy department stores up here, and during the long winter, the women spend a lot of their time making clothing from furs and hides. Even the little ones are kept busy. They start knitting just as soon as they're big enough to hold the needles. 
there's great invention put into the patterns and designs which have been handed down for generations. Eskimo men have a long tradition of ivory carving to follow. Here, Jimmy is putting the finishing touches on a small piece of sculpture. These are sold or traded at the village store and find their way to art shops around the world. It's one of the few means of producing something for cash. Masks were used in religious dances and ceremonies. Today, they are a part of the folklore of the people, and the frightening of evil spirits is done more realistically with a gun. That's why nearly every Eskimo in Alaska has joined the National Guard, because they live so close to the evil spirits who threaten the existence of freedom in the world. The regular meetings of the scout unit on Nunavak are eagerly looked forward to. Wearing their uniforms, these men discuss ways and means of putting their particular talents to better use in the service of their government. Although the Eskimos are by nature a fun-loving people, there's a complete lack of frivolity when it comes to the serious business of learning to be a soldier. To them, it's an honor to be a soldier, and they are eager to learn to be good ones. The weekly drills are big events in most of the communities. They're held in all kinds of weather. They learn to handle themselves and their equipment according to the standards of the army. It's quite a change, swapping spears and harpoons for rifles. But all of them have had no difficulty in adapting their old methods for new ones, in order that their knowledge be integrated with that of the service. These formations take place once a week, but Jimmy and all the other scouts are on the alert 24 hours a day. But the important thing is putting into practice all that has been discussed in the classroom. And after the drill period, they dash off on a practice maneuver. The basic purpose of these units is gathering information and acting as harrying forces in the event of an enemy attack. Their on-the-spot presence would save valuable time needed to send regular troops should an enemy dare an invasion. To many of these men, the mythical enemy of this tactical problem is quite real. Perhaps one of the reasons that the Alaskan Territory has a higher percentage of enrollment in the National Guard than any state in the Union is that they live in the only part of the Western Hemisphere that was invaded in World War II. Early in 1942, Japanese forces landed on the Aleutian Islands of Attu, Agatu, and Kiska. It was only then that most of America became aware of the necessity of strengthening our power in the North. Now that the air route over the top of the world has become the shortest distance between the great powers, it is even more important. Their white wind suits give good camouflage as they advance over the drifts, just specks in the snow. It resembles the walrus hunt, but this is combat training, and they apply themselves with the utmost seriousness to the tactics taught by the army. The job of flushing out the invader. Household larders are stocked when word comes that the men will be going on a long trip they're taking part in a field encampment at Fort Richardson, many miles to the south. Most of them have never actually seen the ways of modern life, and at last they'll get a chance to see things like automobiles and tall buildings. A last-minute chore is ensuring a good water supply. Like many of the things basic to Arctic living, it's a simple task. Just blocks of ice to be melted when needed. Finally, the day of departure. A ski-equipped plane appears on schedule, and the dogs make a lot of noise as they race it to the landing area. There are many airplanes in Alaska, but not many Eskimos get to fly in them, and it will be an exciting experience. 
all of the scouts are determined not to miss this unusual opportunity. Some will travel as much as 70 miles by sled or on foot to a place where they can be picked up. To the north, a group is assembled at Kotzebue. These men live within sight of Russian territory. The international date line runs near their village, and on Monday, they can look across the Bering Straits to where the day is Tuesday. Finally, all from the outlying areas have been assembled and equipped for the long flight south to Anchorage. When Camp Denali appears under the wings, they can see many of the early arrivals already at work. These men realize the amount of time and effort that the Army is putting into the project, and they all listen to the briefings with strict attention. The rifle range is a popular place, but there's one complaint. The targets are too big for these sharpshooters who can hit the eye of a seal on an ice floe at 100 yards. For the most part, classes are held out of doors in sub-zero temperatures. But this is no handicap to men who spend almost all their time in the open. Many hours are spent learning to work as a team, learning to take advantage of all kinds of cover. In some parts of Alaska, there is no vegetation, and scouts from those areas found this a new experience. But their general application had the same elements of patience and observation which they practiced on their hunting expeditions. Meal times were eye openers. The usual diet of the Eskimos is dried fish and meat. Regular army chow was one of the highlights of the encampment for all. It was a proud day for them and we who trained them when the scouts assembled and passed in review for their officers. They had the look of seasoned soldiers. But there was also a tinge of sadness too because it meant that it was time for them to leave Anchorage. Darkness comes swiftly above the Arctic Circle and even though it was only late afternoon, floodlights had to be turned on when the units were addressed by Brigadier General John R. Noyes, Adjutant General for the Alaskan Command. He gave high praise to their progress. But this is only the end of a phase. Training goes on all through the year. At St. Paul's Island, for instance, there's a summer session. Many of the things which were learned at the Camp Denali encampment are put into practice. Outfits observe all the regulations and formalities of the Army. This kind of living is new to the Eskimos, and they like it. He makes a good soldier for the same reasons that he is a self-sufficient person. He is not afraid to admit that there is something that he doesn't know. And after things are explained, he practices by himself so that he won't impair the efficiency of the unit. In contrast with the short days of winter, there are now plenty of daylight hours in which to sharpen techniques. The program is designed to exploit the use of unfamiliar equipment. Entrenching tools are employed for digging foxholes and gun emplacements. Most welcome is the break for lunch when the sea rations seem like a banquet. Map reading is practiced over and over. One of the major purposes of these activities is to assist the scout in translating his natural knowledge into language that will be understood by everyone. Many of the scouts can't read or write English and have difficulty in transmitting information. But one thing is certain. They know how to get from one place to another without getting lost, a most important item for survival in the North. This mission is typical of the things that they work on, gathering information, or as their instructor put it at Camp Denali, go out and see what you can see and come back and say what you saw. The enemy has been spotted, and now to describe the layout so that it's intelligible to the command post. A walkie-talkie gives instant communication between the patrol and headquarters.
No matter what the season or place, these citizen soldiers of Alaska are putting everything they have into helping our army fulfill its mission in the north. But the scouts are only one part of our vast defense program, only its eyes and ears. Further south, we have large installations, places like Fort Richardson, where our army is developing and conditioning its brawn and muscle. Here's the way that part of the program impressed one soldier. Yes, sir. When you first hear that you're assigned to the Alaskan Command, it comes as quite a surprise. Never really think about getting sent way up here, especially if you're a guy who had never been out of the state of Indiana before he joined the service. This place is full of surprises. First off, the weather is so changeable, so much variation. The day we got off that ship in Whittier and started up the Kenai Peninsula to Fort Richardson, it turned out just fine, just like back home in the spring but nobody knew what to expect. Some anticipated a new civilization, and others thought they'd find a frozen wilderness. I guess the truth is somewhere in between. While enjoying the train trip, we were interviewed by a classification team and assigned to an outfit even before we got to Fort Richardson. I'm going to the 196th Infantry. A gal from the USO served coffee and helped keep things relaxed. And there was another one of those Alaskan surprises. Anchorage is just like any town back home. All the improvements of modern living. In fact, I learned later that this place was way ahead in some respects. It seems that when people come from the interior, they want every modern convenience and are ready and willing to pay the price. We finally got to Fort Richardson, and after reading stories about shacks and igloos, it was quite a shock. This was going to be my home for quite a while, and I liked the way it looked. Yeah, things look pretty familiar, just like any other army establishment until you get to the supply room to draw your equipment. Everything is specially adapted for the North. That parka is just about the warmest piece of clothing I've ever seen. The correct size of gloves is extremely important up here. As a matter of fact, there's no detail too small to be important when it comes to Arctic gear. The slightest error can mean the difference between life and death. Footwear has to fit perfectly. By that I mean they can't be too tight or they'll cut off the circulation and encourage frostbite. If they're too big, your feet will blister. A lot of the equipment is stuff you hardly ever see, except in the movies or in a magazine. But all of it has been thoroughly tested before being generally issued. Our army has accrued a vast amount of information from these tests and has developed many kinds of material which is especially designed for the intense climates of the Arctic. And then you get a chance to find out just how good this stuff is. At first, staying upright on skis is like climbing a greased pole. But you suddenly get the hang of it, and it becomes a lot of fun. A physical checkup is given periodically. Being in top condition is a vital necessity in this part of the world. One reason is the extremes of temperature. It can drop 40 degrees overnight without warning. The best means of fighting frigid weather is a healthy constitution.
Another thing that amazed me is the fact that there's no difference between the food up here and back in the States. In spite of the fact that it's all carted thousands of miles, the menus are just the same. But winter or summer, the principal reason we're up here is national security. And most of the energy spent is in that direction. Maneuvers are held every season of the year to provide training for the different conditions which each season presents. Out in the field, unit commanders get together to plot a plan of action. These operations will test and train personnel and their equipment, which will include clothing, vehicles, fuels, lubricants, weapons, and tactics. Under no circumstances will the Arctic provide an easy highway for overland attack on American cities. Preparations like these will discourage an aggressor from considering such a move. It is generally agreed that ground force action against any areas vital to our security could be repelled by a well-trained force, and our army is taking no chances. Final plans are made for mounting a mock attack on an Alaskan town. The tactical problems arising from this invasion will give all units a chance to improve their skills under varying conditions. A flight looms overhead, and the aggressive force floats to Earth. This is typical of the kind of invasion one can expect. Alaska is right in the path of long-range flights, which could come from the other side of the globe. The spring thaw has turned the foothills into a sticky mass, which makes the going difficult for everyone, except the weasels. Like their animal counterpart, they have little difficulty in getting around in all kinds of terrain. Repairs, which are comparatively simple under normal circumstances, become major problems under these unusual conditions. Changing a tank track requires a lot of perspiration and patience. Even the usually irrepressible Jeep has its difficulties. L-19s are used to scout the way ahead. It's very difficult to visualize the state of terrain by reading a map. Vast quantities of water pour down from the melting mountaintops and completely change the shape of the country. Placid streams become roaring torrents, and many ways are improvised to keep moving along. In accordance with the unexpected, a stream has swollen to the size of a river, and the engineers are called to provide a bridge. Boats are unloaded, while a bulldozer rearranges the riverbank to form a pierhead. Then begins the assembly of the pontons, which will be the supporting structure. But nothing is ever simple in the Arctic. There's always the added touch of nature to make things difficult. The glacier is giving off large chunks of ice, which could cause serious damage and ruin all the work. The only thing to do is get rid of them. Dynamite charges are placed in the floating hazards. After all is set, the men move off to a safe distance before the switch is turned. Work progresses swiftly now as the pontons are inflated and rolled into place. Another obstacle cleared by the ingenuity and skill of the engineers. Mobile quartermaster units keep right up with the troops, and a steady stream of supplies roll in and out of improvised storage areas. A welcome sight to a soldier is the bath unit. Religious services are held with the sky, serving for the chapel roof. Our men in Alaska have triumphed over primitive conditions and adverse weather of staggering proportions in order to effect an efficient link in the defense of America. 
vigilant against attack on the ground or from the air. On a recent inspection trip, Army Chief of Staff General Matthew B. Ridgway led a delegation from the Pentagon. He saw and approved the results of our efforts to make the northern frontier safe. Men of America's fighting force are following in the footsteps of the pioneers who settled a wasteland and built it into an important segment of our country's future. Once the object of derision, Seward's icebox is now a key link in our chain of security. The destiny of the United States could someday be at stake in the whistling winds and frigid air of the Arctic. problems of overcoming obstacles which nature puts in the way of our defense of Alaska are being solved. Despite most difficult conditions, men and equipment are learning the specialized tactics necessary for functioning in the Arctic at the peak of efficiency. Our army is ever vigilant at the top of the world. This is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to tune in next week for another look at your army in action on The Big Picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of The Big Picture you can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.